All right, so we're going to go back to some basics to this morning. Um, I've done a bunch of stuff about like cardiac arrest, trauma. Um, we did cases, respiratory stuff. So this morning we're going to go a little bit back to basics and we're going to talk a little bit about PEDS assessment and then we're going to talk about um, management of shock in kids. All right, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, so remember calls involving kids are typically pretty stressful events. We've really got two patients, right? So we have the one who's actually sick and then we have the people who are running around screaming like they're dying and those are the parents. Um, so unfortunately you end up having to kind of treat two people, which makes this a little tough. Procedures are a little difficult. The anatomy and physiology makes their management a little unique. Um, and honestly, we just don't do a lot of this. Um, so calls involving kids typically only account for about three to 5% of EMS run volume, depending on where you are. Uh, some places are up to about 10, um, but it's a small percentage of what we do. And kids who are truly critically ill that require like anything above like an advanced EMT level, excuse me, only account for about 0.1% of pediatric calls. So, you know, it's 0.1% of 5% of what we do. And when you don't do something very often, it's easy to forget how to do it, right? And that's where little simple tools come in handy. So things like start triage. Not a lot of us work MCIs on a regular basis, but we know start triage, right? We have a sort of flow sheet of how we're going to triage those patients that makes it easy to remember how to do things for this high risk, low frequency uh, event. Same thing with cardiac arrest, right? We have ACLS protocols that we know that run us through that for this high risk, low frequency event so that we can recall easily how to do these things. And we're gonna talk about an assessment tool for kids as well. Um, these are the most common EMS calls for children. Um, trauma number one by and far uh, is what uh, we see the most of, and that's because it's also the number one thing that kills kids. In this area and country, uh, trauma is what kills children followed by respiratory and seizures and then ingestions, okay? And the common, the reason this is important is we're gonna talk a lot about assessment, we're gonna talk a lot about shock. And the reason is that these things, the final common pathway by which these kids all die is shock, right? So hypovolemic shock, respiratory that causes hypoxia and hypoventilation that creates acidosis that leads to a shock state. Seizures cause airway obstruction, disordered breathing that create the same, it, basically a respiratory issue again, right? Ingestions, a lot of the things that kill kids, the things that we can, that really affect kids are shock related in one form or another. And if we can treat them aggressively, um, then we can help these kids out. And this just kind of says what we said, this, we don't do this a lot, right? And so we need to be able to have tools to help us out. So real quick, we'll talk about normal versus not normal. These are really, these are normal pediatric vital signs by age. If you're like me, this is way too much information to squeeze into your head, right? Um, I can't even memorize this whole table. I've got other things to remember. Um, so what I recommend is memorize this row and pick one number out of that row, right? So one to eight year old, that's a big group of kids, right? First off, that's probably like 90% of the kids we're ever gonna encounter because that's a large group of children. Um, and then if you pick a number out of each one of these columns, and then you remember the trends of what happens around those numbers, it makes it a lot easier us for us to look at a set of vitals and ballpark it and go, eh, this is good, this is bad, right? And not have to carry around this table. So if I remember 25 for my respiratory rate, and I know that that number gets higher as I'm smaller, right? Then I know that if I say now I have a, you know, six month old and their respiratory rate's 40. Well, if I remember that my number's 25 and that kid's a lot younger, then that's probably an okay number. I'm probably somewhere in the ballpark, right? And the same thing for heart rate. If I pick a heart rate of 100 or 110, and I know that it gets higher the littler I am and lower the bigger I am, then I can easily eyeball that. And same thing for blood pressure. Pick the number of 70, 75-ish. And you know that as you get older, it gets lower and more adult-like, or sorry, higher and more adult-like, right? And the younger you are, it's a little bit lower. So instead of now memorizing this whole table with all these numbers and ranges, I can memorize three numbers and have a big chunk of kids that I can know the number dead on for. And I can also really quickly eyeball a set of vitals in a kid that's a different age and go, yeah, I'm in the right neighborhood, this is probably fine, or eh, this isn't looking so good, right? Because now if I tell you the kid is, is seven, or we'll say 10, 
and has a heart rate of 120, well, you know that number should be going the opposite direction, and that probably means we're not in a great place. All right, so assessment. We talked about we have ACLS sheets, we have uh, start triage. This is our flow sheet. This is our simple three-step method for how we're gonna assess kids, right? And this looks really dumb and I get that. It looks overly simplified. But the reality is simple is good. When it's something we're doing 0.1 to 0.5% of 5% of the time, right? When it's something we're doing three, four, maybe five times a year, the simpler it is, the easier it is to remember, the better it, we're gonna be at applying it, right? And so we try to keep this as simple as we can. So the first leg of the triangle is general appearance, right? So how, does, how is this kid looking? And this is really easy. This is almost like from the door, right? So are they awake and alert? Are they sleepy? Are they super fussy, right? Because kids, if they're in pain, don't really say it, but they get really fussy. The other thing is the kids go into shock before they quickly get sleepy. But before they get sleepy, they have this period where they're really fussy and irritable before they kind of fall off that cliff and start to get really sleepy. So is the kid really grumpy and fussy and doesn't calm down no matter what you do? Or is the kid kind of fussy and, you know, mom gave him his Paw Patrol doll and now the kid's like happy as a clam, right? So sleepy, fussy, are they weak? weak cry, are they strong, are they kicking and screaming, or does the kid just kind of lay in there floppy like a limp noodle, right? So all these things are pretty easy from the door signs, just looking at their general overall appearance. Work of breathing, things we can look at for work of breathing, how fast, so the rate is important, um, and then signs of work of breathing, are they retracting, right? So are we belly breathing, like seesaw belly breathing? Are we seeing subcostal retractions where you can kind of, they're sucking in underneath the rib cage, intercostal retractions where you're seeing all those ribs with like every breath they take. And then noises, kids make a lot of noises when they breathe, right? Um, a lot of them end up with upper respiratory infections, bronchiolitis, and they get that what we call stertor, that congested sound where they sound like Darth Vader's in the room breathing with you and right? So, and then wheezing, right? And so wheezing, we associate, it's a high-pitched expiratory noise. We associate that with like asthma, bronchiolitis, reactive airway disease in kids. Normally you need a stethoscope to hear that, as opposed to strider, which is a high-pitched or inspiratory noise. And we associate that more with upper airway inflammation, right? So things like croup, sometimes foreign bodies. If you're getting ready to take your national registry test, remember epiglottitis, although that's probably the only time you'll see epiglottitis is on your national registry test. Um, and then grunting. Grunting is this interesting thing that kids can do because of their unique anatomy and physiology. It's this kind of sound they make at terminal exhalation that's this little pitter-patter grunty noise. It's uh, uh sound, okay? And this is bad. So if we think of uh, respiratory stress as sort of a continuum from I'm breathing a little fast, I'm belly breathing, I'm retracting, Grunting is sort of last stop before the holy land, right? It's a really late sign of really significant respiratory distress and a sign that that kid is imminently going into respiratory failure. What this is, is because of kids' unique anatomy and physiology, that grunting allows them to create about two to three centimeters of water of peak end expiratory pressure. And so it's essentially a kid who's sick enough who's put themselves on their own version of CPAP, okay? So if you hear grunting in a kid, that's a kid who's in really late, really significant distress, and that's a kid that we got to take seriously. Circulation. So skin temperature and moisture, oops, cool and clammy versus warm and dry. Looking at capillary refill. Capillary leaf refill is something when I took care of adults, I sort of poo-pooed a little bit like, eh, this is worthless. Yeah, okay, it's about four seconds, three seconds, whatever. Um, because it really wasn't super useful to me and I didn't provide me not a lot of information. Kids are actually very different. So kids have fewer mechanisms to compensate for shock, which is something we'll talk about in just a little bit. But one of the things they truly depend on is that kids have increased peripheral vascular resistance compared to adults and they have a better ability to manipulate that peripheral vascular resistance. So they have a very unique ability compared to adults to shunt blood more efficiently. And so squeezing a foot and measuring that capillary refill is actually a really sensitive sign of how well that kid is circulating and how they're shunting blood, which gives us a lot of information about their shock state. 
If any of you bring kids into the ER to me, what you'll typically see is I actually am usually at the foot of the bed unless I have to be at the head to intubate somebody because I can squeeze a foot and check ephemeral pulse and learn more about that kid than anything that the monitor is gonna tell me, right? The pulse ox, the monitor, I don't care. Squeezing a foot and putting a finger on ephemeral pulse tells me more about a sick infant and child than any other thing that I can look at, right? So uh, pulses, not just if they're present, which is always good to know. It's nice to know if your patient has arrested or not, but where they are and how strong they are, right? So if I have a little two-year-old and I can actually feel a pedal pulse in that kid, then he's probably circulating pretty well compared to if I can only find ephemeral pulse in that kid, right? So where they are and how strong they are gives me a lot of information. Their blood pressure. I take blood pressure in kids with a grain of salt, right? Because how easy is it for most of us to get a blood pressure on a kicking, screaming one-year-old, two-year-old, even three-year-old that's accurate in the field? It's pretty much non-existent. Right. Um, and so honestly, I sort of take blood pressure with a grain of salt and use these other things to give me more information. Right. Because I can't necessarily get this accurately. So I'm more concerned about my heart rate and how strong those pulses are and that capillary refill, because that actually gives me way more information about that kid's circulatory status than that blood pressure does. Um, and then their color. Are they modeled? Are they cyanotic? Being blue is never good. I don't care who you are. Um, it's a bad sign. All right, so here's the key to this, guys. The assessment triangle is really useful because it also tells us how sick our kid is, right? Because if they have one leg of the triangle down, they're sick, but probably okay. Two legs, okay, we're pretty sick. Three legs is a kid who is really sick. That's a kid who is in shock, who's heading for cardiopulmonary failure, okay? And so what we're gonna say is then, if you have all three legs of the triangle down, I don't care what the mechanism is, I don't care why you're sick, I don't care how you got sick, you are a kid who's in shock and you require really, really aggressive treatment, right? Because this is really the hard part and this is what we care the most about. We, we wanna find the sick kid, right? Because nobody wants to be the person who thinks the kid is fine and then halfway to the ER, they arrest on you, right? Or think they're fine and you get into the ER and you go to move them to the bed and the docs and the nurse come in and take one look at the kid and go, oh shit, and descend on the kid, you know, like and start intubating and doing things. And you're like, oh, I thought he was fine, huh. right? None of us want to be that person, okay? Uh, and so this is our three-step tool to help us pick out the sick kid, right? Really easy, three steps. You can literally just look at the kid, watch them breathe, and put a finger on a pulse and squeeze like a foot or a hand. And now you can be the one who really easily determines, I mean, this kid's in shock. This is a sick kid. And again, this is important because shock in kids is really the final common pathway by which kids die. It is what kills kids. So signs of shock, by and far, tachycardia is the most common sign. We're gonna say this again in a minute, but if I teach you little else today, it hope it's that kids can be in shock despite a normal blood pressure, period, okay? So kids can be in shock despite normal. You've been taught your entire life that shock equals high heart rate, low blood pressure. And in children, that is a complete lie. The most common and most underrecognized sign of shock in kids is tachycardia. And here's why, guys. These are hemodynamic changes um, in relation to blood loss. So the x-axis here is percent blood loss. You could substitute third spacing of fluid and sepsis, however you want to do it. Trauma is mostly what kills kids. So this is looking at blood loss and hypovolemia. So this is percent blood loss, and this is your percentage of normal. This big, heavy, uh, thick, solid line is blood pressure. This top dotted line is your cardiac out or your heart rate. And this thick dashed line is your cardiac output down here, okay? So at 15% of my blood volume being gone, I've lost 15% of my blood volume. Notice my blood pressure is still different or still unchanged, right? No difference. I'm maintaining a normal blood pressure. My heart rate is jacking up though, right? Same thing, 25% blood volume loss. So a quarter of my blood volume is outside my body still maintaining my blood pressure, okay? This is because kids' hearts are so healthy that they can tack up their heart rate high enough to maintain that blood pressure and truly compensate for that blood loss. Even here at 30% blood loss, right? I've still got a normal blood pressure. So a third of my blood volume is outside my body. Who thinks we're not in shock if we've lost a third of our blood volume, 
right? So our blood pressure is normal, but that healthy heart can get that rate up higher and higher and compensate for that, right? The problem is there's an endpoint to that, right? Like I can only do that for so long and keep that heart get that heart rate up so high before it can't go any higher. And this is where that adage of kids do great until they don't or kids fall off the cliff. However, whatever version you've heard of it, that, this is where that comes from. Because eventually they max out that compensatory mechanism, that heart rate, and then they fall off the cliff quick, right? So here we see the heart rate going down. What's that? That's our patient arresting, right? So we had from here to here on this graph to realize that our patient was in shock by noticing that they were maybe sleepy, had delayed cap refill, heart rate was up, and to intervene. But then we have this very, very small window here once that blood pressure starts to go down and they meet our normal definition of shock before they start to arrest, right? So we wanna be able to catch the kid who's on this side, right? We wanna find the kid who's in shock before their blood pressure starts to tank and we're heading for an arrest state. Right, because we want to be able to have time to manage them and do things like we do over here. Right, so utilizing our pediatric assessment triangle, I tell you that this is a six month old who's a little sleepy acting, whose cap refill is six seconds, who's breathing fast and retracting. Right, and I just give you a heart rate, say, of 180. Right, you just squeezed a foot and put a hand on a pulse. And now you know that that is a kid who has all three legs of the triangle down who has a high heart rate, it doesn't matter what their blood pressure is, it doesn't matter what the mechanism is, you know that that's a kid in shock, right? We are somewhere on this side of the graph and we need to intervene and we need to treat that kid aggressively, right? So causes of shock, what are the things that cause kids to go into shock mostly? Number one by and far is hypovolemic, right? So hypovolemic shock is the most common and not just from trauma. We talk a lot about trauma because again, that's the number one thing that kills kids, but you can actually kids because they have fewer fluid reserves, they can actually puke and fever and diarrhea and whatever else themselves into a hypovolemic shock, literally from dehydration and just a dep complete depletion of fluid reserves, okay? So hypovolemia is by and far the most common. The next most common is septic which is shock from overwhelming infection, right? So what's the good news about that? What do those two kinds of shock have in common? They're fluid responsive forms of shock. We treat them the same way, right? We treat them with IV fluids. And the good news is that you guys can do that just as well as I can, okay? So pediatric shock treatment is actually really, really simple, guys. Treating sick kids is actually pretty easy. Over the years, we did a disservice to ourselves in peds because we said kids aren't just little adults. They have all this unique, weird stuff about them. And we did ourselves a disservice because we made kids scary, right? We mystified kids a little bit. And so everybody got really, really afraid of them. I'm here to tell you I'm, we're, I'm tired of this and we're going to break the cycle. They're little adults. Treat them the same way you do as adults, right? Treat shocking kids is so super easy, right? Because kids are generally healthy. They don't have high blood pressure, heart failure, and years of abusing their bodies. They all generally have healthy hearts, relatively healthy lungs, and a healthy body. So if you treat them well and you treat them aggressively, they get better, right? And so it's really simple. Treat them, treat the ABCDs, treat ABCDE of shock, and if you treat them that way and you run through that and treat them aggressively, they will get better, okay? So airway management, oxygen, right? We are gonna talk about each of these steps a little more individually in a second, but oxygen, kids love oxygen, right? We've sort of been taught to get away from oxygen and be afraid of oxygen, right? Because in stroke and STEMI and you get like free radicals and ischemic areas and blah, 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 blah. Give kids oxygen, they love oxygen, okay? It doesn't have to be a 15 liter non-rebreather. This isn't the old days of EMT class where you slap the high flow oxygen as soon as you said scene safe BSI, right? But give them a little couple liters by a cannula, kids will eat it up, all right? They love it. Keep them warm. This is a big one and this is a big mistake. Our IV fluid resuscitation is next. So A, B, C, treat their circulatory status. IV fluid resuscitation. Again, another thing we that is different than adults 
right? So we've sort of gotten away from fluid as much in adults, right? We used to flood everybody with a lot of fluid, but adults all have unhealthy hearts and unhealthy kidneys. Kids love fluid. They have healthy hearts and kidneys. They need fluid because again, 96, 95 to 96% of the shock that we see is a fluid responsive form of shock, okay? So give them fluid. They love it, all right? And then <clears throat> keep them warm. So A, B, C, kind of I reverse D and E a little bit on this one, but Keep them warm, right? Exposure, E, keep them warm. Kids have a high body surface to mass ratio. They dissipate heat quickly, right? And if a kid, and especially a little baby, gets cold, it'll worsen their shock state. So you got to keep these kids warm. You got to wrap them up, right? Because what's the first thing we generally do, right? We strip them down naked so we can put lines in them, put cardiac monitors on them. And you got the little six month old that's like on the cot, exposed to everything, right? So we got to keep these kids warm. Fix reversible things. So think about mental status, disability, blood sugar is a big one. Narcan is unfortunately more and more necessary in our world. Consider causes of what it can be. And then lastly, if once we've done all this, if we're still in a bad shock state, we got to think about vasopressors to support their circulatory status. We'll talk about all these. So airway management, thinking about the airway of kids. Remember their uh, tongues are big. They're, uh, they have small jaws, they have big heads. They have small, they have big floppy epiglottises with small, narrow, funnel-shaped airways, right? And what does all that mean? It just means that kids are more prone to airway occlusion, right? So a lot of what we think are B problems in kids are actually A problems. So if I take a little baby who's sick and struggling to breathe, and I lay them flat on a cot, that big baby bobblehead flops forward, right? That chin goes down, that big floppy tongue goes back, that big epiglottis comes down, and they occlude their airway, right? The other problem is that kids, babies especially, are obligate nose breathers. They like to breathe through their nose. Babies have two, like three jobs, guys. They're basically born to feed, eat, and sleep. Two of those are the same, by the way. I said that on purpose. But two of those, so kids are basically born to eat, right? And you can't really breathe through your mouth and eat. That's really all babies do. They're born to eat and grow. And so babies are really breathe through their nose. They might be sitting there with their mouth open looking cute, but they don't breathe through it. So if their nose gets occluded and stuffed up, which they all do, they don't breathe very well, okay? So again, what looks like a B problem is frequently an A problem. We can take a little suction. If you don't have a bulb suction in your peds kit, you can take a little 10 French suction catheters like we suction out ET tubes with, clip it off so it's a couple inches long, shove it down their nose, suction on the way out, and you will clear out that nose, you will clear out that airway, and you'll be amazed the number of kids who can't breathe that sound <sighs> like that, that you suction out and they go, ha, huh, and then they look great, okay? So again, the problem with airway is that kids are really prone to occlusion. Picture of a little kid's airway, right? So this is about a six month old, you see that big floppy upside down epiglottis, the arytenoids are a lot bigger than in adults, that narrow funnel shaped airway going down, right? Uh, and so all that means is not only are they prone to occlusion, but managing their airway is a little difficult, right? Traditionally, we've talked about oral tracheal intubation as the standard of care in sick and shocky kids who needed an airway. Historically, though, we haven't necessarily been great at that, right? Success rates for EMS for pre-hospital intubation of little kids is reportedly somewhere around 30 to 35 okay? percent. So we, it's not something that we're typically very good at. And the tube dislodgement rate in kids, once we are successful, is actually really high. About 60 to 70% of the tubes we're successful at will be dislodged by the time we get to the ER, right? And that makes sense, because if you intubate a little, you know, six-month-old with a 4 OET tube, right, the difference between where their cords are and basically their carina is about that far, right? That's not a lot of wiggle room when you're trying to hold that tube and bag bouncing down 65 right? We're going in and out of the back of the ambulance. So our tube dislodgement rate is high. We don't talk about nasotracheal intubation in kids, mainly because kids are really prone to head injuries, right? They got big bobbleheads. Um, but this is where the new generation of superglottic airways has really changed what we do. For years, we focused on BLS airway management and oral airways because kids are generally pretty easy to bag. But new, uh, new uh, superglottic airways, especially like the eye gels, are so crazy effective in 
in kids. They work really, really well. They're a lot easier to size than um, like our traditional LMA. There's also more sizes available for kids. So compared to like the King tube, where you basically had an adult size and a kid size, right? And it may or may not fit the kid. Um, these are a lot more customizable. The gray one, the size one or zero, whatever it is, the gray one goes down to like a 2.5 kilo kid. So that's a really small kid, right? So these things are great. And in fact, studies looking at um, superglottic of the eye gel, um, they looked at not even changing these out for an ET tube and looked at studies of ventilating people in the ICU with an eye gel long term. And you can actually ventilate people at pretty high pressures with an eye gel before it starts to fail. Um, so they're quick and they're easy, right? Most people can pop one of these things in in probably 15 seconds, and that's probably giving you a couple seconds to find it in the bag. Um, so we traditionally, while we've talked about oratracheal innovation as the gold standard of airway management, that paradigm in children is really changing um, because the new superglottic airways are so effective and because we intubating kids is so difficult and it's a skill we do so little um, that we're sort of shifting more to definitely focusing on use of the supraglottic airways. And in fact, looking at trauma, trauma data and pre-hospital cardiac arrest survival data, um, there is no difference with adequate VVM ventilations or a supraglottic airway or an intubation. In fact, there's a couple studies that indicate intubation may be harming kids um, in a couple of those cases. So we really are pushing now for more supraglottic airway usage in these little kids who are sick. Suctioning and positioning are keys to success. If we are gonna intubate this kid, the biggest thing that I can teach you is to prep kids for intubation. These sick, shocky kids who are probably a little hypoxic, who aren't breathing great, we've gotta prepare them, right? Because kids don't have the kind of reserves adults do, right? I can take an adult who sat in 80 and maybe a little on the shocky side, and I can probably intubate them pretty quickly and easily, and it's gonna go okay. Kids need prepared for their innovation, vastly more so than adults. We've got to prep these kids. And here's why. Looking at post-innovation hypotension. So these are people who came in, um, who were in shock, who were shocky. And we look at this and we look, if you had one episode of post-innovation hypotension, right? And these are the things that were predictors of that. This is looking at mainly at adults, but it's a mixed study. Um, you had a high predictive, if you had an episode of post-innovation hypotension, you had highly predictive that you were going to increase um, your in-hospital mortality, right? So if I had post a 15% increase in my in-hospital mortality, if I had one episode of post-innovation hypotension, right? So, and the biggest predictor was elevated shock index, right? So the diff numbers are different for kids. These are um, adjusted shock indexes for kids based on their different vital signs. I don't really care about the numbers, but the idea is if you're in shock before I try to intubate you, I'm probably not gonna do you a big favor when I intubate you and sedate you and paralyze you and start increasing your intrathoracic pressure with positive pressure ventilation, right? Because I'm gonna drop your preload, your blood pressure is gonna go down, and now I potentially increased your in-hospital mortality by about 15%, okay? So the idea is to prep these kids. We've got to resuscitate them before we just jump to doing things like innovation. Now, eye gels are a little different, right? If I'm gonna pop in an eye gel, I'm not necessarily gonna do, like be mucking around in your airway. It's quick and it's over with. Um, so that's a little different. Another reason to push for supraglottic airways. Um, but the point is we got to prep these kids, right? We got to start resuscitating them and doing things before we just move to intubating them. Uh, so tank up your patients prior to intubation. Think of shock index. Kids, again, another reason they commonly are sick and shocking and get intubated is traumatic brain injury. Looking at kids, they did a look at 717 patients with severe TBI, um, had a GCS of less than eight on presentation. If you had one episode of hypotension or one episode of hypoxia around your intubation, if you had yes to either, you had 150% increase in your mortality, right? So again, if the, the idea is the same, we got to prep these kids. If they're hypoxic, bag them with an oral for a little bit or do what you need or just bag, straight bag them. Do what you need to do to get these kids a little bit more kind of in a better place physiologically before we just start giving them drugs and shoving tubes down their throat and stuff like that, okay? Again, so preparation is paramount. Help avoid a bad physiologic sedation, uh, situation, optimize your hemodynamics, replete their volume, and optimize their oxygenation prior. 
The biggest thing is also increasing first pass success. So there was just a study that came out looking at out of hospital arrest. And for every attempt we made at the airway, there was a drastic decrease in ROSC, right? So the best thing we can do to avoid hypotension, to avoid hypoxia, and to help improve our outcomes is also to increase our first pass success. And multiple, multiple studies have shown that your best chance at first pass success in a kid or an adult is video laryngoscopy with the use of a bougie, okay? This is how I intubate kids. I preload my bougie and essentially use my bougie as a stylet. It's really effective and it's really fast because now you're not relying on someone else to like slide a tube over for you and to hold the end of it and do other stuff. You can do it however you want. Um, but these are increase your rate of success in airways from 82% to 96%, right? So if we're thinking about ways to aggressively manage this sick, shocky kid, thinking about ABCDEs, looking at their airway, increasing that first pass success, bougie and video laryngoscopy. Video laryngoscopy used to be hard to get because it was incredibly expensive, right? These things used to be like eight grand each. You can pick up one now for about a grand from most places. The prices of these things have come down drastically over the last few years. So if your agency isn't using video laryngoscopy or you only have it for adults, I encourage you to look into it for kids. All right, A, B, C, D, E of shock, breathing. So kids have high chest wall compliance with lung blow volumes, so they're easy to overventilate. This is the key though, they have horizontally aligned ribs and weak intercostal muscles. All that means is that it takes, when they're working hard to breathe, it takes more force for them to expand that chest wall and take a deep breath. So kids will tire out easily. They can only maintain that work of breathing for so long before they start to fall off the cliff. If we're thinking of trauma, remember that kids have really soft rib cages. Um, and so if you've ever seen cartoons of Wile E. Coyote where he gets popped in the chest, his whole chest like caves in and then pops back out, kids literally will do that. Um, so they can have pretty significant underlying lung injury, even heart injury, without a lot of outward signs. They're not going to have big broken out flail segments and stuff like that. Um, so if it's a trauma kid who's sick and shocky and you're having a hard time ventilating them, think about underlying lung injury. Um, they are, the other thing is that things aren't as fixed in their mediastinum, right? So that's a good news for kids because we don't see a lot of great vessel injury, right? We don't get like shearing of the aortic root in kids because things can flop around a little bit more. The problem with that is if you do have a pneumo and you pop along, things move quickly as air builds up. It's a little more amenable to that pressure differential that then creates tension physiology, right? So when kids pop a pneumo, they're much more prone to developing a tension pneumothorax quickly and need needled. Remember that hypoxia is the leading cause of arrests in kids. So we got to treat hypoxia and hypoventilation aggressively, right? The number of times, and I, specifically I say hypoventilation for a reason, right? So oxygenation does not equal ventilation. This is something I've had to preach for years and years, and I'm going to keep preaching it. So I don't care what your SATs are, if you're working hard to breathe and retracting and breathing 50 times a minute, you're not ventilating well, right? And so we got to aggressive, or the opposite, if you're breathing like six times a minute, you're not ventilating well. You're not exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide. Your SATs might be okay because I've got you on a 15 liter non rebreather flooding every red blood cell you have with oxygen, but that doesn't mean I'm ventilating well, right? And the problem is as that CO2 builds up, they become acidotic. That's going to worsen their shock state or lead to a shock state itself. So we have to aggressively ventilate these kids, right? We got to bag them and ventilate them when we need to. These are just pictures of big old pneumos. This is a hemothorax side of the chest filled with blood. If you needed an x-ray to find this before you put a needle in it, you have somehow failed at life. That's all I can say about it. Uh, circulation. So kids, we've talked about this. They have smaller circulating blood volume. That's really important because everything is relative, right? So, you know, the average 10-year-old, 150, or sorry, one-year-old, the 150 mLs of blood is roughly a third of their blood volume, right? Whereas if I lose 150 mLs of blood, no big deal. I can go to the Red Cross and donate more than 150 mLs of blood, and they give me my cookie and my orange juice, right? And I walk out a happy person with my little I donated t-shirt, right? But kids are different, right? So everything is relative. So what might look like a relatively small amount of blood, because we're used to looking at adults, 
can actually be a really significant amount of blood loss for them, right? So again, 150 mLs is, almost, is about a third of the circulating blood volume of a one-year-old. So think about that when we're looking at blood loss, think about how that's relative and go, ooh, wait, that doesn't look like much, but that probably is a lot for that little tiny baby or kid. Fewer fluid reserves, we already kind of touched on this. Kids can sort of puke, vomit, and not eat and dehydrate themselves into a hypovolemic shock. They do have higher peripheral vascular resistance and their ability to manipulate that is pretty high. What is the problem with that? Well, it makes access difficult, right? So if I'm shunting blood and I'm vascular, have some peripheral vascular, you know, constriction and collapse, it gets really, really hard to put an IV in me, right? Especially if I'm a little one-year-old, that's tough at baseline, right? They have those chunky little arms, hard to find veins in. So what do we like? We like our IOs, right? We love our IOs. So IOs are, are drastically underutilized both in the hospital and in pre-hospital setting. Um, if we have a sick, shocky kid who has three legs of the triangle down, we got to be aggressive with that kid, okay? And that means aggressively obtaining access and resuscitating them, all right? Remember that IO is a category A procedure for not just cardiac arrest, but also shock in kids. So if you need an IO in a shocky kid, put it in, right? Just, we like proximal tibia mostly. Um, once you're about past, you know, sort of eight years old or so, you can start thinking about proximal humerus. Um, in kids, if you look at x-rays of their proximal humerus, it's basically a little tiny ball with a big gap. There's just not anything to really drill into because of their bone development. Um, so we really mostly, for kids, talk about the proximal tibia. And in little babies, we talk about the distal femur. Um, the tibia is pretty soft and small, and especially little babies, like four-month-olds, two-month-olds. Um, and it's really hard to not just kind of drill right through it. Uh, but the, proximal, the distal femur is a lot easier, right? It's a little more developed, it's a little more hard, it's kind of a bigger bone. So you go about one finger width above their knee, drill straight down, use the blue needle, not the pink needle, because kids have those chunky thighs, you gotta get through all that baby fat, drill straight down, and you get that more of that change in resistance that you're used to going into that more solid bone, that larger bone, and it's a really reliable access. I've done cardiac arrest off two femoral IOs. Um, really reliable access and easy to use in the little, little babies where that tibia is just really hard to drill and not just blow through, okay? Uh, and then aggressive fluid resuscitation. Uh, I just put crystalloid. I don't care what fluid you use, right? Normal saline, LR, everybody's on a big LR kick right now and LR is the best and we're gonna use LR to resuscitate everyone. The reality is if you've been in medicine for more than five minutes, you've seen that pendulum swing about five times. So I'm pretty sure in about two years, we're gonna be back on a normal saline kick. I really don't give a crap what kind of fluid you give them. Just give them a crystalloid fluid, okay? 20 mLs per kilo. Traditionally, we've taught that we're gonna do that three times. So 60 mLs per kilo total um, before we start to give them pressors. We've started to back off that a little bit and say maybe we should be doing it after two. But the reality is if you look at kids and you put in like CV, central venous pressure monitors and you look at resuscitating like shocky septic kids, the reality is that most kids get about 110 to 120 mLs per kilo of fluid before they're truly adequately resuscitated. So kids really do like and need fluid. So two to three boluses, 20 mLs per kilo each, right? Depending on the size of the kid, it may be easier instead of trying to squeeze a bag to just get some flushes, right? Because if you're three kilos, that's only 60 mLs, I can just give you six, you know, 10 cc flushes. Um, so however you want to do it is fine with me. Draw it off the bag and push it in because uh, sometimes those little IOs are hard to flow. But 20 mLs per kilo times two to three. If that's not what we're what not working, we got to start thinking about pressors, all right? We have two pressors right now in the field. We have epi and we have dopamine, all right? Coming soon, levofed. Yay, finally. Uh, but dopamine is a pain in the ass, right? It's nice because it generally comes as a pre-mixed bag. But how many people like taking a seven kilo infant and calculating five to 10 micrograms per kilogram per minute, counting some drops and figuring out that dopamine drip in the back of your ambulance as you go down the road? Anybody, anybody? No. Also, it's just kind of a crappy presser, to be really honest. It kind of sucks. Uh, and it's not really good for sepsis. Um, the What is a great presser for, actually, what's great for everything in kids is epi, right? Epi is a great drug in kids. The reason we don't love epi in adults is because it stresses your heart a little bit. And adults have shitty hearts. 
What do all my patients have? Healthy hearts. They love Epi, and Epi works really, really well for them, especially in sepsis. And it's a lot easier to give using the push dose method than it is to try and hang a dopamine drip. Okay, so I encourage you, if you're going to be doing pressors, if you've gotten through those two to three boluses of fluid, your pressure still sucks, you got to do something to get the, or just they're circulating badly and still really tachycardic, because again, I don't really care what their pressure is, and you're moving towards pressors, think about your push dose epi. Remember, this is one to 100,000, not one to 10,000, okay? It's called sometimes called microdose epi, push dose epi, there's like 800 different names for it out there, okay? Easiest way to do this is to take a 10 ml flush, squirt an ml out, then drop one ml of one to 10,000, that's cardiac arrest epi, shake that up, and that gives you a one to 100,000 concentration, okay? Then the dosing gets really simple. It's 0.1 mLs per kilo up to one ml every three to five minutes, okay? You can remember the micrograms and try and do that if you want. Don't waste your time. Here's the trick. You know what the average weight of a one-year-old is? 10 kilograms. So basically everybody one and over gets one ml. Everybody under one gets the 0.1 mLs per kilo. Easy enough. One and over gets a whole ml. Under one, start thinking about the weight dose. Okay, so this is pretty easy to, when you think about it because we fortunately don't see a lot of four and six month olds. Generally, most people we take care of are one and over and you know that they can all just get one ml. Okay, the other way to do this if you want to be really, really fancy is you can take a 100 ml bag and squirt the whole um, Brista jet of Epi up into it. It'll create the whole, the same exact um, concentration. To me, that's act and then you can just draw off each dose, treat the bag like a vial. To me, that's actually a lot harder than just mixing a flush, honestly. Some people like that better because they don't have to squirt out and draw up, but I think that's actually a lot easier than trying to mix this whole bag and draw off each dose, but whatever makes people happy. I think the flush uh, method is great, Plus the flush method gives me a whole 10 cc syringe. So that's 10 doses of microdose epi. Chances are, I don't know, there's not too many places that are more than 10 doses of epi away from the hospital, especially by the time you've gotten through two to three fluid boluses and you're moving to that epi. So I think that's probably the easiest and the most efficient way. All right, remember we're treating the ABCDs of shock. So disability, remember kids have a wide range of normal based on age. They are really prone to head and cervical spine injury. So if they're really out of it, really acting really funky, probably their shock state, but do we have signs of trauma, right? Is this a kid that we thought was medical, but now we realize, oh wait, this kid has a big old hematoma over their head, right? And maybe we have some neurologic injury. Um, but kids also get into a lot of things, right? So shocky kid who's acting funny, who's not breathing very well, who's not, maybe not breathing at all, right? Respiratory arrest. We got to start thinking about Narcan, right? Kids get into a lot of stuff. We have a lot of narc ingestions around here, all right? So Narcan, there's the dosing for it. It's actually pretty easy. If you're over five, basically just give them the full adult dose. If they're under five, give them either a half a milligram or a one milligram. I don't care about this weight-based dosing. This is what I put up here because this is what the protocol says. But to be really honest, you can't really OD anyone on Narcan, not a little baby who's gotten into something. So if it's if they're under, if they're two to five, just give them one milligram. If they're less than that, give it a half milligram or give them, and then give them another dose if they need it. Make it really simple. Don't make it too complicated. There's not a lot of point in doing that math, to be really honest. Exposure, A, B, C, D. Now we're on to E finally. Again, we got, sort of already touched on this. High body surface to mass ratio, kids dissipate heat. Being cold is your worst enemy. It will worsen your shock state. You've got to keep these kids warm. After we strip them down and put all their monitors on and get our access, we got to cover them back up, right? Crank the heat up in the back of the unit. You got to keep these kids warm because if they get cold, it's only going to make our management more painful, okay? And then kids have low glucose stores. So the sick, shocky kid who has all three legs, the triangle down, never the wrong answer to check their blood glucose. Always, always the right answer, honestly, to check your glucose in any sick kid. You can never go wrong. Um, because a little bump of dextrose can go a long way. Just push four mLs per kilo of D10, and it goes a long, long way in these kids who are hypoglycemic and sick, All right? So summary, kids can be in shock despite a normal blood pressure. 
If the third time saying it isn't enough, I'll say it one more. Kids can be in shock despite having a normal blood pressure. Look at their perfusion. Look at their heart rate. Look at those that pre, uh, pediatric assessment triangle. Are all three legs down? If they are, I don't care what their blood pressure is. You can completely ignore it. You've got to treat that kid like they're in shock and you've got to treat them aggressively, okay? Use that assessment triangle to find the sick kids. If they're all down, they're in shock, like we just talked about. When treating shock in kids, think about A, B, C, D, E. Treating kids is super easy, guys. If you correct the derangement in these letters, 90% of the time, they will get better, okay? So A, aggressively manage their airway. B, ventilate them, correct their hypoxia. C, IV fluids, pressors. D, did they get into something? Do they need some Narcan? Do they have an injury, neurologic injury? And then E, check, keep them warm and check their glucose. If you run down A, B, C, D, E for every sick and shocky kid, you will fix most of them before you ever hit my ER doors, okay? It is super simple. It's literally like five letters. Even I can remember that, right? And then remember for when we're treating these kids and we're giving them fluid, pressors can easily be given utilizing the push dose method. It's safe, it's effective, it's something we're used to doing. We're not used to hanging a lot of drips. We're very used to pushing half an ml, an ml out of a syringe, right? So utilize it, it can, it's really effective. I use this at Children's all the time in super septic, like really shocky kids, right? Because it takes my pharmacy a minute to mix an epi drip. And I generally, if I want epi, it's not something I can stand around waiting eight minutes or so for pharmacy to send me. So I give him some push dose epi while I'm waiting on my drip, right? All right, that's it for me, guys. Any questions? Hey, yeah, we had a couple of questions come in. Uh, I'm trying to actually get the, uh, so question number one, we kind of had a discussion about this on the chat board. What sizes do you think it's appropriate on the IGL for an agency to carry? Because they come in half sizes too. Yeah, um, let's see, the 2.5 is the little kid, and I think that's the gray one, and that's like a size one. Honestly, if you've got two, and the two goes down to five kilos, so if you've got two or three and up, you're probably safe, because you're not going to be running on a lot of little tiny two, four, and six-month-olds, um, and honestly, those kids are generally pretty easy to bag, um, and so I would say, if you're really looking to conserve some money and not carry as many that are going to just expire before you use them, if you get the kind of size two and up, or even like 2.5 and up, you're pretty well covered. Yeah, well, five kilograms, that's, I mean, how old, that's what, 11, 12 pound yeah. kid, 12 yeah. pound kid. So that's most, even infants, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying, you'll get down to about a six month old with that. And we're just not running on many 12 month olds. Gotcha. Um, the other question had to do, I think, about EM, um, EMS IV fluid choice. Um, they just asked, so you're saying that you don't care about the pH difference in the fluids? No, honestly, given what you got. I mean, if we want to really get technical and talk about physiology of shock and sepsis and sepsis guidelines and, you know, need for dialysis later and the like, we can talk about the pH of the fluids. But the reality is none of it matters in our setting for our purposes. I don't care what it is. As long as it's a balanced crystalloid fluid, either LR or normal saline, just give it to them. Gotcha. So the point is, is that, that kids really respond well to fluids and respond well to epinephrine. Yep. All right. That's all the questions online. Anybody uh, here in the classroom have? You can hear me okay on the mic? Good deal. All right. Guys, I appreciate y'all being here. Thank you for coming in person. Thank you for watching on the internet. Um, we're going to talk about seizures today. This is uh, a lecture that um, is personal for me. It's important for me. Uh, when I was a medical student rotating through one of the military hospitals in San Antonio, we had a guy come and give a lecture on pulmonary embolisms. And he started off by saying, hey, you know, I was on this flight and I got down and coughed up some blood and had a big swollen leg. And in short, I had a pulmonary embolism. And to me, that that stuck with me. The rest of his lecture stuck with me because it was personal to him. And so this is something that's personal to me. I've got a six-year-old son now 
that um, got diagnosed with epilepsy, was just a normal healthy kid, and then started having seizures. Um, last year, we spent a little over three weeks, almost four weeks in the PICU at Children's um, in status. And, um, you know, so for those reasons, this is this is a, a topic that's kind of close to my heart. So, um, you know, I want, want you guys to be able to take care of these people really well. Um, feel free to stop me at any point, ask me questions, um, and uh, we'll get started from there. Um, I am definitely not a neurologist. Um, I feel like I need to start off by apologizing if there are any neurology experts watching for how I'm about to simplify this. Um, I'm gonna break this down into the way that I kind of think about it. So I break it down into pretty simple steps and um, try and simplify it as much as possible. And hopefully that'll be helpful. Um, so, so that's my son, that's Luke. Um, the reason I put this picture here early on is because um, I wanted you guys to see the EEG electrodes that are taped to his head. Um, a lot of times when you see these pictures, they have the wrappings on them and it's kind of hard to see what's going on. But these are the little electrodes that they'll tape to their head. Um, they get placed in this anatomic distribution and it maps the electrical activity in the brain um, and it helps localize where the seizures are coming from. Um, that's actually what uh, that background is right there. That's actually how the EEG looks. And the left side of the screen, sorry, the right side of the screen is what a normal um, encephalogram would look like. And then you can see it starts to get erratic towards the middle and it's a little more consistent with kind of a seizure pathology. Um, so uh, this is the outline and the things that we're gonna go over today. Um, I put the H and P a little bit later on. I know typically we do H and P kind of early on in these, but I feel like it will make a little more sense if we go over the seizure phenotypes um, before we get into the history and physical, because I think it'll flow a little better that way. So, um, this is straight out of the um, the treatment protocols right now. Uh, it basically says, you know, ABCs, IV and then benzos, benzos, benzos. Um, and we do this pretty much the same way every time. The only exceptions to this are if we think someone's pregnant, in which case we're gonna go down that like eclampsia pathway and we're gonna be given a magnesium uh, before we give them the benzos. Um, but uh, one of the big things to note about this, particularly right now, we've got Ativan, which is lorazepam, and midazolam, which is Versed. Um, if you'll notice that we've got to give the Ativan IV, and I don't know how many of y'all have tried to start an IV on someone who's actively seizing, but it's not ideal. Um, the Versed you can give IM. There was actually a study back in 2012 in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is kind of a big deal, um, that showed that IM Versed was actually superior um, to IV um, Ativan in getting these things to stop. So any benzo will do the trick. You use what you got. Um, but if you've got the option to give something IM in someone who's actively seizing, uh, that's a pretty pretty quick thing to do, and it's not wrong. So it's a great thing to do. Um, and is any of this going to change in that new in the new protocol update? Okay. All right. Um, this is a map from the CDC that. Uh, is basically just seizure prevalence. Um, they estimate that in the state of Alabama, we have about 54,000 um, people who are diagnosed with epilepsy right now. So this is definitely something that you see if you've worked in the ER, if you've been out on the streets for uh, just a short length of time, uh, it's almost guaranteed you've seen people that have seizures. Um, now, one of the things about this map is that uh, if you notice like the big states that are like in bright blue, this is just the number of people who have epilepsy. So it's not a percent of the population. So there's more people in California, there's more people in Texas, there's more people in Florida. So those states are gonna have brighter colors. Almost no one lives in Wyoming or Montana. So none of those people have seizures up there. Um, so it, it, it's not, you know, the proportion of the population is just straight numbers, if that makes sense. Um, so there was a paper in neurology back in 2020, so pretty recently, and they estimated the incidence um, of seizures to be about 102 
uh, per 100,000 people. Um, so that's 102 calls for seizure, seizure per 100,000 people in the population is kind of what they estimated. Um, I pulled the run data from Mobile Fire from last year, and basically they responded to 734 calls uh, for seizure in 2020. Um, that's a city with a population of about 200,000. So if you take the neurology paper numbers, that should be somewhere around 200 calls, and they saw 734. So that's 500 and some odd more than what was estimated. Um, and the reason I say that here is because about half of the things that we get dispatched to that come out of seizure, not actually seizures. You know, you get there and it's syncope or it's something else, you know. Um, so I think that 100 per 100,000 people is probably a little bit low. You're going to get dispatched to more than that. Um, and the truth is going to be somewhere between those two numbers, you know, that 730 number and the 100 number. Okay. Um, so it's important to distinguish between the word seizure and the word epilepsy. They kind of mean the same thing. They get thrown around a little bit interchangeably. And there's also something that I mentioned. I said seizure mimics earlier um, when I said, hey, half these things aren't actually seizures that you're getting dispatched to. Um, those are seizure mimics. So um, the call is always going to come out of seizure, right? Someone's going to call and say he was shaking and then he hit the ground. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have epilepsy, okay? So we're going to go through the actual definitions for what that stuff is. So a seizure is just a sudden uncontrolled electrical disturbance in the brain. It can cause changes in behavior. It can cause changes in your movements. Um, it can cause changes in levels of consciousness to various degrees. Um, if you have two or more unprovoked seizures, or if you have a tendency to have recurrent seizures, then you have epilepsy, okay? Um, and a big, a big part of this is the unprovoked part, okay? Um, so we have to distinguish between a provoked seizure and an unprovoked seizure. And this is not anything that you're responsible for doing in the field, okay? No one expects you to go, this is provoked or unprovoked. Um, a provoked seizure is something that has an identifiable trigger, okay? So someone just got whacked in the head with a golf club and then they had a seizure, right? So they had they had a brain injury and now have a seizure. Um, you get on scene and someone's blood sugar is 15 and you got dispatched for a seizure, okay? So they've got a hypoglycemic seizure. Um, someone had a stroke and now they had a seizure. So they have this identifiable cause that can be reversed, okay? Um, the old definition used to just be kind of this top part um, that you just had to have the two unprovoked seizures occurring more than 24 hours apart. Um, and then the rest of this is basically for neurology. Um, they basically added a clause in here that said, listen, if you have this genetic uh, susceptibility that we've identified that you're more likely to have seizures, we can just say you have epilepsy and we don't have to wait to do these things. We can go ahead and treat as epilepsy, okay? Any questions about that? In terms of pathophys, um, there are a bunch of different reasons um, that we have seizures. Um, has everyone heard the term seizure threshold thrown around? Quiet group, quiet bunch. That's We're all having seizures. <laughs> We're all having seizures right now. Um, so the term seizure threshold basically means uh, that we all exist on this spectrum of susceptibility to have a seizure, okay? Um, some people are more likely uh, because of genetics to um, be lower on that threshold and have seizures more frequently. Um, that threshold is affected by a bunch of different things. Um, it's affected by medicines, it's affected by our genetics, it's affected by our um, electrolytes, it's affected by our sleep, um, by infections, um, if we drink alcohol, if we have a stroke. In fact, stroke is the leading cause of seizures in people that are older than 65 years old. Um, if we're pregnant, you can get a clamp dick and have a seizure. Um, so there's all these different things that kind of move us up and down on this spectrum that make us more or less likely to have seizures. Um, 
So a cause is never identified in 60% of seizures, uh, but we don't really need an identifiable cause to treat with benzos. We're going to reverse any causes we can if they're hypoglycemic, um, but if they're actively seizing, they get benzos. Um, so the other big thing that plays a role are neurotransmitters. Um, there are, we can essentially break this down into two categories, um, and we can say that you have glutamate, which is a hormone produced by the neurons in the brain, the presynaptic neurons. Um, and glutamate will bind to glutamate receptors on the neuron. And glutamate tells the neuron, it just basically, all these, neuro, all these hormones do is carry a message. Um, and so the message glutamate carries when it attaches to that receptor is just to tell the cell to fire an electrical impulse. So it increases the excitability of the neuron. Um, GABA is a kind of receptor, and there's lots of different things that bind to GABA receptors. So alcohol, benzos, phenobarb, all can bind to the GABA receptor. When it activates the GABA receptor, all it does is tell the cell, hey, cool off, don't send any impulses, just slow down, okay? Um, all these seizures start with a single susceptible neuron, and then they can concentrically expand and engulf these greater and greater proportions of like these neuronal bundles, kind of like a ripple in a lake here. And that's kind of how a seizure will spread. Um, so one of the reasons that, the big reason that we are giving benzos um, is because it binds to those GABA receptors and it's sending that cell message that says, hey, stop sending impulses, stop sending impulses. So it's basically trying to put a hard stop on the electrical activity of the neurons. Does that make sense? Cool. I, that's not something that I realized when I was a medic. You know, I just was like, oh, this is the treatment. I guess that's what we're doing. But that's actually how it's working. So, um, so classifications of seizures. Um, I'm going to try and make this as simple as possible because there's a bunch of different words and terms that get thrown around. Um, there's two giant classifications. So when we talk about seizures, we're either talking about partial seizures or we're talking about generalized seizures, okay? Uh, we're going to go through pretty much all of these. Uh, we're going to group the generalized things together. Um, so if the whole brain is affected, it's a generalized seizure. In other words, if you have uncontrolled electrical discharges firing from both hemispheres, that's a generalized seizure. Um, if you have just a discrete or only half of the brain firing, then you've got partial seizures. Um, we'll go through this whole thing and talk about partial seizures first. Um, so in terms of partial seizures, I think of simple complex and then the secondary with generalization just along the spectrum of bad to worse, right? So a simple partial seizure um, just means that a single neuron or a small bundle of neurons is affected in the brain, okay? Um, this is not going to spread across the cortex. This is not going to generalize. Um, this is one of the two kinds of seizures where the patient will not lose consciousness. They won't have a postictal state. Um, and it's because it just affects this small, uh, this small bundle. Um, Let's see if I can get this to work. No. Chief, am I doing something wrong? In the video? Yeah. Okay. So, let's see. <clears throat> That's okay. Um, so that, that was actually a video that I had of my son in the hospital uh, when he was sick initially. So um, he had, like I said, he had the EEG on and they were able to localize the seizures to um, his right temporal lobe. And so that's actually a video of him. He's sitting in bed and he looks almost completely normal, but he's kind of got a draw to uh, the left side of his face and he has a respiratory arrest. And so he's just sitting there 
kind of like this. And the only way you would know that anything was going on is because the alarms, you can hear the alarms going off, the DSAT alarms in the background. And I can say, hey, buddy, you need to take a breath. And he'll go, you know, and he'll breathe. So he's still conscious. He can still follow commands. He doesn't lose any muscle tone. Um, he can blink, you know, and then it's over. And you go, hey, buddy, I can say, where are you, man? And he says, I'm in the hospital. I'm at the doctor's, you know, so there's no post phase. He immediately knows where he is and what's going on. OK, um, that's something that probably would have driven me nuts if we hadn't known that and hadn't localized that on his EEG, you know. Um, so um, anyway, sorry, sorry, the video doesn't work, but. Um, <laughs> um, complex seizures start out as a focal seizure and they can spread across the hemisphere of the brain, but they don't cross the corpus callosum and they don't generalize to the entire brain, but they look exactly like a generalized seizure. There's no way to tell this apart in the field, okay? This is the only thing we can distinguish this on the EEG. The top half of those lines or the bottom half of those lines will show seizure activity and the top, the other half will not. Um, that's the only way that, that we can we can tell this apart. These kids and adults will um, will have a postictal phase. They'll have generalized, um, you know, tonic clonic jerks. Typically, it's on just half their body because only half the hemisphere is affected. So you might see just on one side of the body doing this instead of this over here. Um, but the treatment again is the same. Um, partial with secondary generalization is actually the most common seizure type in adults. So you have an area of the brain that has these um, susceptible neurons and those neurons exist at a lower threshold than the rest of the brain. Um, and what happens is there's an insult, um, something happens and they start to fire and the person has a focal, just a simple um, partial seizure and that's a lot of times what people describe as that aura that that you have before a seizure. Um, and then you get this concentric spreading and it globalizes and does cross the corpus and involves the entire cortex. Um, and so it starts there, it crosses and it generalizes to everything. Um, I bet this video is not going to work either, is it? I would say probably um, not. So this was a really good video I had. It was actually of, um, <laughs> this is actually a video of a fireman that had new onset seizures at the station while he was washing the trucks. Um, and it's a great video because it shows how it starts out as a partial seizure. So um, everything's fine. He's out washing the trucks. And the first thing you notice is his head kind of turns like this and he doesn't lose consciousness and he's trying to stabilize himself against the back of the ambulance. And he's, he goes like this and he's like this for a few seconds and then it generalizes and you can see both arms draw up. He loses all muscle tone. He falls and he has, you know, 30 seconds to 60 seconds of these generalized shakes. Um, they load him up, get him in the ambulance and they got him to Grandview in like five minutes or something crazy. Um, but it's a um, it's a great example because that is the most common way that it presents in adults um, and that's that's pretty typical to see um, when you're doing your history and physical one of the things we'll talk about is asking the you know the, the bystanders who saw it you know what they saw and that's a pretty typical initial presentation say oh you know they were fine and then all of a sudden they they turned like this you know um, but that's a good segue into generalized seizures um, we're going to break this into this big group right here. We're just going to break it into two categories. Um, I remember in medic school, they taught us about petite mal seizures and they taught us about grand mal seizures. Um, absent seizures are petite mal and everything else. Like there's no real benefit to distinguishing these in the field for what we do. They're just having a seizure. Um, that's grand mal seizures. Um, so we'll dive into grand mal first and then we'll come back. We'll circle back and um, hit the absent seizures. Um, 
seizures are all typically time limited events. Um, they, they actually don't require emergent intervention and they don't typically have lasting consequences. Um, the exception to that are prolonged seizures and that's what we're here for. That's what we need to treat. Um, and so then we start to use the term status. They'll say, oh, this person is in status. So if a person has a seizure and it lasts less than five minutes and they stop seizing, that's okay. You don't need to rush in. You don't need to hit them hard with benzos. That means that their bodies, um, their body essentially reset the way it was supposed to. So um, when we talk about status, what we're really talking about are two different time points. Um, we talk about the five minute mark and we talk about the 30 minute mark. At the five minute mark, that's, that time is important because at that time, that's when the seizure is unlikely to stop on its own. So at that point, we would say that um, the GABA receptors have essentially failed um, to control the seizure and we need to intervene. Um, and so at that five minute mark, that's when we need to hit them really hard with benzos. Um, for us in the field, if you get dispatched to a seizure, uh, by the time the bystander figures out what's going on, gets a phone, calls 911, goes through dispatch, gets you guys en route, and y'all get there, it's going to be more than five minutes in most cases. Um, if you get there and the person is still seizing, you can assume that this has been going on for more than five minutes, and I would treat this as status, okay? So if you get there and the person is still actively seizing, I would go ahead and take action. Does that make sense? Now, on the flip side of this is you have someone in the back of your truck for another reason. You got called for something completely separate. You know, there was no, no history of seizures and this person was, you know, dead set normal and then had a seizure in the back of your truck. I would give their body a chance to correct that on their own because most of them will. Um, especially patients who have a history of having a seizure. Does that? Yeah. Yep. And so we did have a question come in. Uh, I think it's related to what you're talking about right now. Mm -hmm. and, and it's something we see sometimes. So the specific question was, could a patient with a history of aortic dissection with recent chest pain presenting with low pressure pressure cause a seizure? And I think that question is uh, points to a lot of instances where we have a patient for a reason other than seizure yeah. that begins seizing because of uh, organic reason why they have reduced perfusion to the brain like dysrhythmia Correct. or sepsis or some other shock form yeah. and so really if we have a patient who starts seizing we need to immediately do abcs rather than think about treating seizure in the beginning is that a fair statement yeah yeah it's always it's always abcs you, like you said you if you witness the onset of that seizure they get five minutes you know they get five minutes and at that, that, that point you're doing abcs Almost all of these patients will PSAT. Um, and so um, you don't need to RSI them, but you may need to put supplemental oxygen on or bag them to keep their SATs up. Um, a lot of times that's a transient thing. If this lasts longer than five minutes, then the focus becomes breaking the seizure. Uh, there was actually an instance of that when Luke was sick where he desatted and they said, we need to intubate him. And someone else said, well, he's still seizing. We have to stop the seizure. Once we stop the seizure, he started breathing again and we avoided intubation. Specifically, when we're talking about an aortic dissection, um, that so that's not typically limited just to the aorta. So you can have that dissection that then tracks because it follows the coronary arteries up into the brain and you can get decreased perfusion because of that. And that's actually a really common cause of stroke, which therein is a common cause of seizure. Um, and so that would be a provoked seizure. Um, but again, Regardless of cause, they all get that five minute period um, and then you hit them hard with the benzos after that. Is that what they're asking? Yeah, I, I think that's it. I think the, the main point there is that if somebody abruptly starts seizing while they're under EMS care, that we need to think about the most likely, most likely threatening things first and mm -hmm. maybe not get distracted by the seizure activity. You have, yeah, if you have any change in your patient, regarding if it's seizure or anything else, my, my practice was always to start all the way over ABCs. You know, it didn't matter if I was in the middle of some algorithm doing something else. I would start from the beginning, start over ABCs all over again, correct those things, and then keep moving. So, yeah, I've seen a couple of charts that I've reviewed in their recent uh, past where there has been chest pain or stimmy, and then the patient has a seizure, 
and the uh, care was directed at that point to airway and versed. And then once they did that, they was realized, oh, look, they have no pulse in their big fib. So any adult with seizure-like activity, mm -hmm. it's hands-on. Touch a pulse, look at your monitor, should be on there. If there's an airway issue, I would argue that you probably don't just put some mental oxygen if they're having a seizure. Think about ventilation issues, do a jaw thrust, open the airway, nasal trumpet. If that doesn't work, then some O2 and ventilate them until they start come back around. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you definitely don't want to miss somebody in cardiac arrest that's having seizure-like activity yes. because first aid does not fix the fib. And that's the seizure, that's again, the seizure mimics, you know, that we talk about, so. And, and the other kind of pragmatic part to that is we don't immediately want to be putting a, we're trying to put a little risk in somebody's mouth or seizing because that's going to, you know, cause a lot of trauma. Yeah, that's going to be a pretty difficult intubation if they're actively seizing. Kind of fun back to the church. Um, yeah, and, and again, if you can stop the seizure, they'll start breathing again, if that's the cause of it. Now, you have to distinguish, is this an actual seizure, or like what Dr. Ferg said, is it a seizure mimic, and they're actually in arrest? Um, so, ABCs, start all the way over. Um, so, the second time point that we talk about when we say status is this 30 minute mark. Um, the reason that's important is because that is when irreversible brain injury has traditionally been taught to um, taught to happen. There's been some papers come out recently that says you probably get some irreversible brain damage before this somewhere in the 25 minute mark. Um, so this is when um, we're talking about really taking their airway um, and doing everything we can to get them to stop seizing. Uh, one of the issues that we have once we get them to the hospital, once they get an initial dose of benzos, um, as many of y'all have seen, if you give a lot of benzos to someone, they, they, they get snowed. And it's hard to tell if they're seizing subclinically and the benzos have just muted it a little bit. And that's why we put them on the EEG so we can actually record that brain activity and see what's going on. Because you can have patients that are still seizing that aren't having these giant jerking motions, you know, in their arms and legs, they can still be what we call subclinically seizing, and we would really need to intervene on that as well. Um, the treatment algorithms, um, some of the newer algorithms, and this is just an example of one down here, uh, is just uh, basically to use some anesthetic agents earlier to try and avoid getting to this 30 minute mark. So we really want to try and get them out of status before they hit that 30 minute mark. Uh, because if they didn't have epilepsy before and they do have this scarring of their brain tissue where the seizure is happening, they'll almost certainly have epilepsy after that because of the scar. Um, so there were really three uh, generalized, generalized seizures that deserved kind of noteworthy comments in here. Uh, the first one was status that we just talked about. The second one is eclampsia. And the third one is going to be febrile seizures. Um, the only reason we're talking about eclampsia here um, is because the treatment is different. Because you're going to hit them hard with mag, and then you're going to hit them hard with benzos. 90% um, of the ladies who will have eclampsia will have it after 34 weeks gestation. So they will be obviously pregnant in 90% of the cases. But in 10% of those cases, they can have it earlier that. And then they can also have eclampsia up to a month or six weeks after they deliver, okay? So even if you have a mom that's having seizures and she's two weeks postpartum, I will still treat that as an eclamptic patient. I would give that patient mag and then I would give them benzos. Um, and so this is really the only time that the treatment in the field is gonna be any different, okay? Um, Hopefully we'll see a little bit of a revision in this, in the uh, the history and physical exam. If they're pregnant and seizing, you just assume that they have eclampsia uh, until proven otherwise. Um, I would not withhold the mag and, and say, oh, well, they didn't have, they didn't have peripheral edema. And so I'm not going to, I'm not giving a mag. I'm not going to treat them as eclampsia or say, oh, they, did, they don't have any right upper quadrant pain. Well, they're seizing and they can't tell you. You know what I mean? <clears throat> um, so if you have a pregnant female or a postpartum uh, female, I would treat them as eclamptic until proven otherwise. 
Also note that that's a lot of mag. That's twice the code dose of mag that we're given. Um, so note that it's that's a bunch of magnesium. Um, <clears throat> so the last kind of noteworthy generalized seizure is a febrile seizure. Um, I know Dr. During sees these probably every day that you're working at Children's. Um, his seizures. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So there are, there's, a, there's, there's criteria for this to be a febrile seizure. Um, they have to be between six months and five years old. They've got to have a, great, a fever greater than 100.4, and this can't be in uh, the setting of a CNS infection. Um, this gets broken down into two categories. Um, basically, a simple febrile seizure is exactly what it sounds like. Um, they have a short seizure and then they come back to normal within about 15 minutes and they don't have any neurodeficits and they don't have an infection. And then a complex is anything outside of that. So um, they have a super long seizure or when they wake up, you know, they can't move half their body or they start to have other seizures. Um, so if they have a recurrent seizure that no longer falls into the category of a febrile seizure. I, when my son initially got sick, that's kind of what I was hoping for. I was like, you know, this is kind of the seizure that you want um, because these kids don't need to go on medicine. Um, they'll get better on their own. They have an overall small increase. I think it's what, like less than 5% Shay, of developing epilepsy in their lifetime. It's a small percentage, but it's a, a third of the it's, kids have another seizure. Of, only a third of the kids who have febrile seizure will ever seize again. A third of that third will ever go on to having another like seizure. Disorder. Okay, so it gets, it gets cut down pretty small. Um, my hope when Luke initially had his seizure was that this was going to be a febrile seizure, um, but then he seized again within 24 hours, and that kind of got thrown out. So I was I was pretty bummed about that. Um, any questions about the big grandma generalized seizure types before we move on to absence? So um, one thing about febrile the the occurrence of febrile seizure does not um, predict that that patient's going to develop epilepsy in the future. Is that correct? They're, they're at a slightly higher increased risk of having epilepsy in the general population, um, but it's not a, it doesn't mean that they will. And it's my understanding that febrile seizures in that six month to five year old age range is very common. Would you mm -hmm. agree with that, Dr. Perry? Yeah. Okay, so um, there's no real way in a febrile seizure for us to know if there's a CNS infection, right? Because they're going to have a fever. So we, we don't have a way to diagnose that in the field. Those kids that, that do come in with high fevers and they meet the criteria uh, for getting like an LP or if there's a suspicion um, for having a CNS infection, we'll get like a lumbar puncture. Um, and that that's the confirmatory test for it. And we're not definitely not doing that in the back of the truck right now. But it's very low risk. So with a simple febrile seizure, your risk of sepsis or meningitis or sinus infection with a simple febrile seizure is less than 1%. Mm -hmm. So it's, if it's a simple febrile seizure, you can almost bet there's no CNS infection. Gotcha. If you had a less than one percent, you're taking those odds in Vegas, right? So, so we we really need to change our our treatment stance a little bit and our sense of urgency. If we go to a call and there's a there's a toddler infant who's story fits a febrile seizure, mm -hmm. they're supposed to go and get there, and then they start seizing again. Now we're in a different category of right. patient. Yes, now they're seized twice. So even with complex febrile seizures, though, the best the biggest study ever done looked at like 560 kids with complex febrile seizure. And of the kids who had complex febrile seizure, there were only two cases of CNS infection or meningitis. And they were all kids who did not go back to baseline, were ill appearing, like obviously had something wrong. Mm -hmm. So even with a complex febrile seizure, your risk goes from like less than 1% to about 1% that there's CNS infection. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them just end up having a recurrent febrile seizure. Good. Yep. Um, these, these are typically some of the hardest um, these are probably some of the hardest parents to deal with. Uh, seizures are, I think, probably the top three, two to three scariest things that, you know, that you can witness. 
Um, especially for a parent. I mean, I can say that because I've seen it now and I feel like I'm a little more equipped than your average bear to deal with that at home. And uh, I'm telling you, it still sucks. It's bad. Um, and so uh, anyone who's been on a call for this knows that the parents are going to be freaking out. Um, and you're going to probably, you might even spend more time managing them than managing the actual patient. Um, so any other questions before we move on? All right. Absent seizures. Um, so these are these are unique. Um, this is not something that you're likely to see or get called to in the pre-hospital setting. Um, they've been called petite mal seizures in some of the EMT books, um, as opposed to like the grand mal seizures that we just talked about. Um, this typically affects school age kids. Um, a lot of times these kids will get misdiagnosed with like ADHD or they'll get in trouble at school for like misbehaving or, you know, um, you know, ignoring the teacher in class or something like that. And what's really happening is they're having these like momentary lapses in consciousness. So absent seizures, or partial seizures are the only two where you still retain muscle tone and there is no postictal phase. Um, for these kids, everything's normal, 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 and they'll have a short seizure where they zone out for a few seconds, and they come back, normal, 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 and they'll zone out again, and they blink, but they never lose muscle tone, so it looks like they're just kind of staring off into space. We're unlikely, it's unlikely that we get called as an emergency for something like this, um, but just want to be thorough in going through all this. Um, there's a special medicine that they go on. There's something called ethosuximide, um, which is different than, you know, like the typical Keppra and things that you see other seizure patients who take. Um, and there's a very unique EEG pattern that they use to diagnose this. Um, I had a video of this that I'm assuming probably also will not. Oh, look, it's going to work. All right, perfect. So what they're doing is they're actually provoking the seizure by getting to blow, 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 blow. They're, he's blowing off all of his CO2. And that's actually the seizure right there. So they're saying blow, blow, blow. And then he just kind of zones out, but he doesn't lose muscle tone. He's still blinking. He still has some like muscle activity and then he comes back to normal. So kind of a unique thing. Um, all right, so now that we've kind of gone over the subtypes. Um, important things to ask during the history. Um, obviously the first, the first two questions, do they have a history of seizures? Have they been taking their medicine, right? Um, and we see this all the time on the adult side uh, where you go, this person comes in by EMS, they had a seizure at home. Hey man, have you been taking your Keppra? No, I've been out of it for three weeks. Okay, cool. So we'll give them Keppra and then we'll make sure they can get their prescription. And then we send those people home most of the time and they can follow up as an outpatient with neurology. That's different versus people who have never had a seizure before and come in and we have to do this whole workup and scan their head and get neurology down there and they might come into the hospital. Um, so it's a pretty easy fix. Um, but those are the, the two most important questions that we ask. We want to know if they're immunosuppressed because anyone who's immunosuppressed, um, so AIDS patient, cancer patients, anyone who's immunosuppressed that has a new onset seizure, you presume that they have a CNS infection until proven otherwise. Um, that's the same. That's why we have cancer up there. Um, asking about alcohol or drug use. Um, again, we all exist on this spectrum and alcohol can lower that seizure threshold and cause people to seize. Um, same thing with drugs. You can take drugs that make you seize or you can withdraw from things like alcohol or benzos and that in turn can make you seize. <laughs> it's amazing we aren't all seizing right now. Um, and then pregnancy because we don't want to miss uh, we don't want to miss the eclamptic patient. So those are the big questions to ask. Um, in terms of physical exam, <clears throat> there's not a single physical exam finding that is going to confirm or rule out seizure. Um, but there's things on the physical exam that support the idea that the event that the patient had was a seizure. The most specific thing is lateral tongue wall biting. I didn't realize that as a medic and I never did check anyone's mouth to see if that was the case. Um, but that is the most sensitive finding is they'll bite down on the side or the tip of their tongue. And so now when I'm doing my assessment on anybody and they say, oh, we think they had a seizure, um, 
as long as I think that they won't bite me, I'll get a four by four and I'll pull their tongue out and look at the edges and at the tip to see if they bit their tongue uh, because it just kind of, it kind of helps point me in one direction. Um, the eye exam is important in these people. So if you get someone you think may have had a seizure and you get there and they're postictal, um, you want to check their eyes. If their eyes, if their pupils are dilated and they're focused on one side, so they have a fixed gaze with some nystagmus beats, they're likely still having a seizure. That would concern me that they're still seizing. And so I would give them benzos in that situation, okay? Um, incontinence is the one that I feel like always gets taught. Like it's in all the books. They're like, yeah, the patient peed their pants. Um, there's a ton of other reasons people pee their pants. People can drink too much and pee their pants. People can get hit by a car and pee their pants. We see this in trauma a good bit. Um, not everyone who sees this pees their pants. So it's a plus or minus thing. If it's there, that's great. You can go, you know what, they peed their pants. Um, but it really doesn't help us that much. Um, the other thing is uh, in the physical exam, are they postictal or are they normal in talking to you? Did you get called for a seizure and now the person is like, completely normal at baseline walkie talkie um, because that postictal state usually lasts for a while. Um, so if they're all of a sudden back to baseline by the time you get to the scene, I'm suspicious that maybe what happened wasn't a seizure or at least wasn't a generalized seizure. Um, questions about that physical exam stuff? How common is it to see somebody that's violent in a postictal state? It's pretty common. I would say it's not uncommon. It, it, go ahead. What's the recommended management of a violent patient in the post state? Keep yourself safe in the back of the truck. You know, um, if they're violent, you can always call for orders to, uh, you know, basically, and I think that's going to change too, right, yeah, Dr. Derrick? The orders on um, restraints. So I think it'll be a little bit easier for you guys to um, keep yourself safe in the back of the truck. Um, they're not, this is, so these people who are post or this is different than someone who went to a concert and drank too much and they're just a bad drunk. They're just an unfriendly drunk person. You know, this is not a psych patient. This is someone who legitimately like has a mental, you know, they had a, they had a brain problem and now they're encephalopathic is essentially what the problem is. They're confused. Might be the nicest person in the world when they wake up. You got to keep yourself safe in the back of the truck. Um, but at the same time, I wouldn't, I wouldn't jump on board with like, sedating them really hard. Um, I think, you know, for someone like that, I would, I would, I, it depends on the situation, but keep yourself safe, use physical restraints if you have to. Um, but uh, just know that, that that is because they're postictal. It's not because, you know, they're just a jerk or something. So. Well, it could always be both. It could be both. It could be a jerk that has students and now they're <laughs> the postictal jerk. If your question was, do we do ketamine versus benzos? I think if you see someone seized, the postictal, and as they start coming around, they're kind of combative, confused, scared, trying to fight you. Benzos are probably a better drug for that person at that point. Yeah, yeah. if that was the Correct. question. If it's undifferentiated, excited delirium, you're concerned for safety. Ketamine is probably a better option. Mm -hmm. But if you knew they had a seizure and now they're freaking out, benzos are probably better. Yeah. Um, I put this up here because there's a unique physical exam finding called Todd's paralysis. That's Dr. Todd from Scrubs. Um, the guy on the right is a guy named Robert Bentley Todd. He was an Irish doctor um, that basically first kind of described this phenomenon. But basically, um, Todd's paralysis occurs after a seizure and it results in a partial transient hemiplegia. So they'll seize, they'll be postictal, they'll kind of wake back up and they won't be able to move half their body. Okay. And you'll go crap this is a stroke and there's really no way around not calling it a stroke so you'll have to enter these people into the stroke system um remember that stroke is the most common cause of seizure in people over the age of 65 and so there's no way to know if they had a stroke and then had a seizure or if they had a seizure and now they have todd's paralysis does that make sense just know that it's a unique physical exam finding does it mean that they've always had a stroke. This could be just this leftover hemiparesis from Todd's paralysis. It can last for like one and a half days where these people legitimately cannot move half their body, but then it resolves on its own.
So is there any reason, for example, not to give a fluid bolus? As no, I mean, unless like someone is floored and like volume overloaded for whatever reason. There's not no extra reason if it turns out it was just touch paralysis. No. no, and that's a diagnosis of exclusion. And right. These folks get worked up like a stroke to prove right. otherwise. We're, we're going to code strokes them when they get here. Yeah, and I can tell you, if they don't have a history of it documented or we're not really sure, and there's no contraindications, they will get liced for a stroke <laughs> for cause paralysis. Because risk to benefit, you got to do the right thing. Yep. 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 Um, seizure mimics is a big one, and we kind of we kind of beat around this for this whole talk. Um, there's a bunch of different things that can be a seizure mimic. The most common one is syncope. Um, <laughs> the fainting goats. Um, yeah. So, not a seizure, syncope. Um, we see this all the time, um, where you know. Someone will come in and they'll say, hey, you know, they 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 hit the ground. They were shaking. It's not uncommon to see shaking in these sinkable patients. Um, you can have a sudden loss of consciousness. A lot of times in the sinkable patients, though, they have this rapid return to baseline. They don't go through this postictal phase. This gets complicated in a lot of our older population that have dementia that don't have a normal baseline. Anyway, you get a call to the nursing home and they're worried and, you know, it looks like maybe they tripped on the rug and fell and then had a few shakes and then you say, you know, this person can't tell me where they're at and the nursing home goes, well, I don't know. The nurse that took care of her is at lunch and she just got here yesterday and we can't find any of her stuff. Y'all need to take her to the hospital. And so we see that a good bit. Um, do you know why they, do you know these goats are bred this way? They do this on purpose. They, 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 these fainting goats, they put them with like more expensive livestock. And so if a predator comes, the goat will faint and freak out and the predator will eat the goat and the expensive livestock can get away. Fun to watch. Farm farm fact of the day. <laughs> um, and we really hit this a couple of times here. Um, you know, was it a stroke or was it a seizure? You know, is it Todd's paralysis or is it a stroke? Um, they can have a TIA and have this transient loss of consciousness. They can have some what looks like seizure activity. And they can kind of wake up and sort of come back to baseline as that neurodeficit deficit resolves. It's really hard to say, was it a TIA that resolved or was it a syncopal episode or was it a stroke? Um, there's a lot of sleep disorders. Um, narcolepsy with cataplexy can do this. Um, I don't know if when you're laying in bed and, you know, you shake, you know, you've all woken up from a dream with that big shake. It's not a seizure. It's just a hypnotic jerk. Um, but believe it or not, people will call 911 for this. Um, migraines actually present with a similar aura a lot of times as focal seizures um, and can present sometimes the same way that focal seizures present. Um, this is kind of my favorite one to talk about, this uh, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, otherwise known as conversion disorder. Um, this was actually called uh, the wandering uterus in the 1700s. This is this is a phenomenon that's been described for hundreds of years. And um, some of the earliest descriptions in the 1700s basically said this is isolated to women and we think their uterus comes out and inhabits other parts of their body and puts pressure on them. And that's why they act this way. And the only reason, there was no real medical reason they got away from this. The only reason that they abandoned this theory was because men started to have the same symptoms. And they were like, well, I guess it's probably not the uterus. Um, so this has been something that's gone on for a long time. <laughs> um, you're almost guaranteed to see this at some point in your career. We see it in the, we see, you know, we see it at children's all the time. We see it in the ER all the time. Um, these people will come in and they're doing this and they're going, I'm having a seizure. I'm having a seizure. And you're like, this is not a seizure. You're not having a seizure. Um, some of the telltale things um, that would lead me to believe this is not an actual seizure. Um, if they have asynchronous extremity movements, if they're doing this. So if their eyes are closed and they're going, ah, that's that's not a seizure. Um, rapid head turning, you know, the no, 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 that's not a seizure. Um, pelvic thrusting, which I will not act out for you. Um, <laughs> eye closing. Uh, that's the most specific thing we have 
to go, I don't think this is a real seizure. Uh, people who are having real seizure, their pupils are dilated, their eyes are wide, and they're typically uh, deviated to one side or the other. Um, a lot of times, you know, you'll be taking a history on these, these patients. And one of my favorite questions to ask if I don't think it's real, I'll say, you know, well, what happened while you were shaking? And they'll go, oh, you know, such and such rolled me over and they did chest compressions on me. And, you know, it's like, well, they can remember all these things. That was definitely not a generalized seizure, you know. Um, if they're crying during the event, uh, that's, you know, that the, if you're crying during an actual seizure, that's probably not real either. Um, this is not that this is a fake disease. It's not a real generalized seizure. It's an actual disease process and it's real to these people. Um, one of the things that complicates this a little bit is that 40% of these people who have this diagnosis also carry a diagnosis of epilepsy. So just because you get on scene and someone says, yeah, she's got a history conversion disorder, doesn't mean it's not an actual seizure. 40% of those people have a seizure disorder. You just got to distinguish between the two. Um, so that's my son at some point during the hospitalization. Um, you can see the EEG on, it's all wrapped up so you can't see the electrodes. Um, he was encephalopathic for a couple of weeks and actually had to have the mitts on so they wouldn't pull everything off. Um, in terms of hospital management, um, it's not that much different than in the field. ABCs, IVO2 monitor, we get a blood glucose. Um, we can get labs if patients have a, um, a history of seizure and they're supposed to be taking medicines and we suspect that maybe they had the seizure because they weren't taking their medicines, we can get these therapeutic drug levels. Some of those are send out labs and they won't come back while they're still in the ER with us, um, but it will help neurology moving forward when they follow up as an outpatient. Um, some of these patients will go on to get a CT. So Luke actually had a CT in the ER and they went on to get several MRIs and several EEGs um, and then he got two or three LPs as well um, looking for infections and looking for um, sources of the seizure. Um, first line for us in the ED, same thing, it's benzos. Um, hit them hard with benzos. Um, can't stress that enough. The biggest thing is just to make the seizure stop, make it stop, okay? Um, Second line, we're using Keppra, we're using Phenytoin, um, and then third line, we're talking about intubating them and putting them on these drips of some pretty powerful anesthetics to get this thing to stop. Um, big takeaways, um, we're all gonna see this, whether you work in the ED, whether you work out in the field, um, we're gonna see this. These are people that we're gonna have to deal with. You're gonna have to distinguish if this is a real seizure or if you think it's something else. Um, and sometimes those lines can be blurred, you know, as in with the stroke um, and Todd's paralysis. Um, there are a bunch of different reasons that people have seizures. We all exist on that spectrum of susceptibility. Um, so getting a good history and asking those questions is important. Um, give them benzos. If they seize again, give them benzos. Hit them hard with benzos. Make it stop. Um, don't let them get to that 30 minute mark. Um, one of the things I should have mentioned in that earlier slide is when they do hit that 30 minute mark, um, it gets harder and harder to control the seizures with benzos as time goes on because the GABA receptors actually get downregulated and the glutamate receptors actually get upregulated. So it makes it easier for them to continue to seize and it gets harder and harder for us to use the medicines we would normally use to fix that problem. And so I'm a big advocate for hitting it really hard up front and making it stop and avoiding any of that brain injury. Um, so make it stop and then, you know, be thorough. Um, there's a lot of things that present as seizures that aren't seizures. Um, so this is, uh, this is my crew. This was taken uh, about a week ago. That's Luke with the, uh, Missing the front tooth there. He just turned six. Um, still having seizures at home. Frequency is getting a lot better. He's on four different medicines. Um, one of which is a uh, like a CBD derivative, which is kind of a newer thing that we didn't get into in this talk. Um, but uh, started kindergarten this year. Has been out of the hospital for a while. Um, getting better. Never found a cause. Never knew uh, what caused it. Um, and so he's just getting treated for epilepsy. So. That is what I've got. Um, these are all the references that I used. That's it for me. What kind of questions we got? Uh, 
couple. Yep, so we had a couple. Uh, one backtracks a little bit to Dr. During. Uh, in fact, they both kind of involved Dr. During a little bit. Um, the first one was uh, so we don't have a appropriate size eye gel. Uh, which one works better for, for younger kids, OPAs or NPAs? OPAs if they'll take it. OPA if they'll take it, but nothing wrong with an NPA so long as it's the right size. And I would venture to say that if your agency isn't carrying all the right sizes of eye gel, then they might not be carrying all the right sizes of NPAs as well. So maybe you need to buy some more equipment. Um, the other one is just simply, so what's the treatment for febrile seizures again? I think this was in context of, hey, if they have a repeat seizure, it's not really febrile. So if we define that as febrile seizure being an isolated event mm -hmm. just for the, the temperature change mm -hmm. and the treatments. <laughs> so anyone who's actively seizing treatment is benzos. So if you get there and they're still seizing, you're giving them benzos. So your job, your job isn't really to diagnose. I think it's a febrile seizure or not, because they can still have a CNS infection. And like Dr. Daring was saying, it's a small percentage, but they can still have a CNS infection and you know have an alternate cause for having their seizure other than just a temperature spike. Um, so if they're still actively seizing, you're still giving them benzos in the field. Um, the long, there is no long-term treatment. If it's a true febrile seizure, then they won't need to go on any antiepileptics. Um, it'll just be observation in the hospital in the ER most of the time. They may bring them in overnight to observe them. Um, but if they say, hey, this is actually a febrile seizure, you get to go home, everyone gets a free pass the first time. All right, got it. Okay. Um, you got something? All right. I think that does it for all the questions that people submitted. Dr. Birch, do you have anything to add? There's a few more things, that, and we may have touched on it, and I kind of uh, glanced off for a second. But don't forget, seizures, ultra mental status, always get a glucose. Uh, you know, you can burn through that pretty quick. You get hypoglycemic, you can have seizure-like activity. If you miss it, you're going to feel bad. You can actually fix hypoglycemia. Remember, with adults, seizures, always think cardiac arrest. If you dispatch to a seizure and you get there and they're not moving, Maybe they had a seizure and stopped, or maybe they had a seizure until they were in VFib and now they're dead. So always take all your gear in, check them for that. Also think with seizures, always think about things we can fix, hypoxia, hypercapnia. Uh, we talked about low glucose. Maybe they have some kind of head bleed or a stroke, and that's why they're seizing. Think about things like that. Um, updates, don't forget the SMEG is November 2nd on the coast at the conference. Uh, October 27th, we're at the Fire College. We'll do lectures from 9 to 11 in a skill lab from noon 30 to 2 30. We'll do surgical airways, mega codes, and advanced airway techniques. November uh, is going to be different. EMS challenge will only be one day in November, and it'll be November 12th. That's a Friday. We'll be at the Alabama Area Rescue Squads, no, excuse me, the Alabama Association of Rescue Squads Conference at Orange Beach. We're going to do a special EMS challenge uh, geared toward EMTs and intermediates. Uh, in advance and then do a skills lab that day. And then December 8th will be the only EMS challenge in December. And that'll be the second Wednesday. We'll be at the new Brims building. There'll be free food and skill labs there. So if you're in the Brims area, please come out there. Uh, and that's all I got. Any questions, comments, statements from the crowd, from the other docs? We had one um, one more question come in, which was what about thiamine for seizure patients? I don't think there's a need for that. It's not going to do anything acutely. Oh, sorry, Jason, I apologize. No, no, that's fine. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, that was not going to hurt me. Um, you know, if, if you think it's an alcoholic in his season, or something, you can give him thiamine to help clear lactic acidosis. It's not going to hurt him to give the thiamine, but it's probably not going to fix their seizure. Right. Benzo fix their seizure. Right. That's whatever they need. Or form a beer. <laughs> you probably can't do that and get in trouble. Okay, so on that final okay. note, of uh, the uh, physician advised to fourth bane of beer will wrap this session up. <laughs>